want to pronounce it properly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for the uh, invitation to make such a plenary lecture. And of course, for your introduction. Uh, I'm coming from University of Zagreb for, from the Department of Chemistry, where I spent uh, most of my research time in physical organic chemistry. My first projects were in the field of carbocations and their spectroscopy in uh, cryogenic conditions. Then I switched to reaction mechanisms in solid state, especially if in crystallinic and uh, polycrystallinic phase. And when I started to do that, at, I found it that to define what this reaction mechanism is such solid, uh, in such a solid uh, crystal that it is very, very complicated and very complex. And somehow this moved to me to start complexity as a phenomenon which appears in all the fields, not only of science, but in all the fields of, of our life and the nature. So, uh, second thing is uh, systems. System theory is something which is today, I think, very actual because it is uh, interdisciplinary. It can be used for everything, for every uh, systems, either in nature, either in society. And I found it that there are some similarities between those two between complexity and systems. So after, I would say, very long period of research, especially in the field of complexity, I decided to, to somehow to find out how complexity or theory of complexity is related to theory of systems. Let's first go, let us first go to complexity. What is complexity? I think it is very difficult to define. As I know, John Hogan in his popular book, The End of Science, has quoted Professor Lloyd, who told him 45 definitions of complexity. That means it is very, uh, let's say, fuzzy uh, term. And even if it is fuzzy term, that it could be fuzzy science. But there are some new approach to complexity. For instance, there is a mathematical or computational view on complexity based on the theory of cellular automata uh, developed by John von Neumann. And approach to this has been published 20 years ago by Stephen Wolfram in his book, The New Kind of Science. What he made, he made, uh, he has uh, made uh, algorithms by which starting with some simple rules, you can get different patterns, let's say graphical patterns and such patterns can, can have different complexity. And Wolfram in study, what is this complexity and how it can be uh, rationalized. Okay. In the literature, the idea about complexity, as I have mentioned, appeared in the broad spectrum of theoretical constructions. Is this only terminal technicus or we can make or construct some unequivocal definition of complexity or some relatively unequivocal uh, representation of complexity. This is one first goal of my talk. But first of all, what we can recognize in complexity, in theory of complexity, that there are two sorts. One is complexity of processes, and another is complexity of structures. Interestingly, both those phenomena are very well visible in chemistry. Complexity of, uh, 
processes appeared in, 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 in history of science, this uh, complexity of processes is more known as theory of chaos. And it has been recognized and established by uh, Belousov and Jabotinsky. They found, they are studying uh, oscillatory reactions and they found that some, uh, some reaction systems can be extremely complex and can show very different behaviors like oscillations, like irregular oscillations, like whatever. Of course, the problem was how to rationalize this system of reactions. Until now, there is no final version of reaction systems which appear in such complex uh, chemical systems. What about complexity or of structures? Uh, complexity of structures is also very, very visible in chemistry. We have structures of molecules, we have crystal structures, we have electronic structures, electron density structures. That means this is another way of structure. It is also very well known from chemistry. So in theory of complexity, the complexity of structure, they call synchronic complexity and uh, the complexity of processes they call diachronic complexity. That means we have definitely uh, two sorts of complexity. What is interesting, let us start with synchronic complexity or complexity of structures. It is also broad literature and discussions about complexity levels. But let us uh, discuss only complexity levels in the field, in the frame of synchronic or structural complexity. Oh no, what we can uh, recognize as subatomic, atomic, molecular, supramolecular, and so on levels. But uh, what is interesting with those levels is that uh, entities on the higher level have uh, something what I call the identity of higher order. This open, this discussion of about complexity opens also another discussion. It is the discussion about identity as itself. In my uh, book, Philosophy of Chemistry, I have proposed that there are different orders of, of uh, identity. For instance, first order of identity is the substance, water. Water is, uh, is the same phenomenon, whether you prepare it from oxygen and hydrogen or you isolate it from some natural material or, and so on. This is always the water. Water always has the same identity. But what is higher order identity? For instance, uh, second order identity are crystals. Crystals are original and their identity is a consequence of the history of their growth. That means it is somehow higher level of, uh, of identity. And such principle also could be valid for the system of levels of complexity. Jump from lower to higher level complexity is possible by the impact from outside by environment. This is, I think, something very important and I will discuss it a little bit later. But there is a third point, whether complexity can grow ad infinitum or complexity has uh, some limits. First of, of all, let us take a uh, uh, basic idea what is criterion by which we have divided structural complexity in such levels? Uh, the criterion which I have proposed is the energy of interaction. For instance, in this uh, A, you have uh, nuclear forces. That means if you make, for instance, atomic nucleus from, from uh, basic particles, you need 
very, very big energy is a, uh, you need very, very big energy interaction. If you make chemical ones, the energy which released is uh, almost 100,000 times smaller. This scale is a uh, logarithmic because in the real number, it is not possible to show. Next step C is a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is only a little bit uh, uh, weaker than chemical bond. And then D supramolecular bonds and so on and so on. And if we look this diagram, if we go in the right direction, then those energies of interactions will be smaller and smaller and finally at infinitum they will disappear that means we cannot go to uh, structural complexity at infinitum and there is also another side of this diagram if you go if you go on the left side that means if we go to simplicity if we wish to reach absolute simplicity we will need uh, infinite energy. That means absolute simplicity and absolute complexity are not possible if you, we are looking in structural complexity. But where is chemistry? This is an interesting. Chemistry is something in the middle. So many people say that chemistry is central science, also in this sense. Okay. But there is also another type of complexity, which I have mentioned at the beginning of my talk. It is combinatorial complexity based, for instance, on a, on a few examples. One example is a definition of complexity, let's say combinatorial complexity by Andrei Komogorov. We will see that in chemistry, we have very good example for the theory of Andrei Kolmogorov. They are structures of molecules. What is complexity by Kolmogorov? It is the length of the shortest possible description in some fixed and virtual description language. I will show you in the example in more details what it is. And another thing is what I have already mentioned is complexity of cellular automata automata uh, developed by Stephen Wolfram. Definition is complexity is the pattern that results from the algorithmic developments of particular rules. Okay. First, Kolmogorov. This is chemical example. If we have on the top of this slide, we have structure of undecaying. It is a simple hydrocarbon. And his representation or description is very simple formula, CH3, CH2 times nine, CH3. That means it is not very complex because it has very simple representation. These CH2 groups are just multiplied with nine. It is not complex, but there is a structure of uh, this alkaloid on the bottom, which description the description is in the frame of chemical nomenclature, extremely complicated. I would say that the description of this steroid structure is of the same complexity as this steroid itself. I think this is maximal Kolmogorov complexity, but I think this is very good representation what Kolmogorov complexity is from a chemical viewpoint. Let's go to Wolfram complexity. Wolfram started with those uh, with those simple rules. It is like a, a, a play of life. Many people know what it is. That means depending which are those boxes here, the next row is either black or white. And then we step by step build starting with these rules, row by row, and we obtain some pattern. And this pattern has uh, some complexity. It is not very complex because we see here the, the plane of symmetry. But there is another, another rule. This rule is different. And this uh, pattern is complex. It is nested structure, how we can call it. It is much more complex. 
That means starting with different rules, we can obtain patterns with different complexity. Oh, okay, this is also nested structure from some third rule. So we can use 250 rules, which has proposed, which has been proposed by Wolfram, and make different patterns and to analyze how those patterns are complex or simple. Okay, but one point is important. What is complexity? What is entropy? Whether if something has higher entropy, it is more complex or is not. It's, it is in correlation, maybe this is the same. But looking in the literature, we have uh, found the way how to solve this problem. One the way is to use Claude Shannon entropy of information. Uh, definition of Claude Shannon entropy is that the probability that the system assumes particular configuration is its entropy. And here is formula, which I will, as I believe many people know it much more than, than myself about this formula, about these calculations. What is interesting that this part of formula is very uh, close to Boltzmann entropy, except here is Boltzmann constant and here is the number of possible configurations. So that means it is the same thing, but just appeared in information theory. But how complexity studied by from uh, analysis of formal languages in linguistic, in mathematical linguistic, is related to entropy. But this is interesting. If entropy goes from order to disorder, complexity has its maximum at some value of entropy. That means it doesn't mean that complexity is maximal here or here, but complexity in something, not in the middle, but let's say in the first half of entropy values. If we look, but Shannon entropy can be also used for Wolfram's patterns. So Wolfram had analyzed complexity of his patterns obtained by algorithmic approach and has calculated entropy of those patterns. And what we found, he found that there are many possibilities that this pattern like this is homogeneous. That means it is some fixed, it's not complex, it is homogeneous. Then he can go to some other patterns in the middle by some other rules or some patterns are periodic or some patterns are complex, but well, those are complex, those three are ne have nested structure by Wolfram criteria. And also some patterns are completely chaotic. But if we, if we here are only five of those, but uh, Wolfram has calculated complexity for all 250 patterns, and he made, he found the following diagram. If here is entropy and here is complexity, that if we go with, uh, if we go with complexity, that complexity, sorry, here is order or, or disorder of those patterns. And there are many different cases. Here we have this, pattern appears at this complexity. Here is entropy. That means entropy falls down as a one sigmoid, depending on how complex, how complex pattern you have used to calculate entropy. Interesting, this is sigmoid. That means this pattern by Wolfram criteria, which is by Wolfram criteria most complex, appear at the inflex point. Here is homogeneous, it is maximal complexity, maximal entropy, sorry, but not, uh, but not uh, complexity. And here is starting point, with, which is chaotic. That means complexity appears at, at the point of maximal change in entropy. 
maybe this can be uh, compared with earlier diagram in which complexity is calculated versus entropy. But this diagram looks like looks like first derivation of sigmoid. If you make first derivation of sigmoid, then you got this one. But I mean, it is the same thing and the same conclusion. And, and from this, we have a we have a uh, we have a definition of new definition of complexity. Complexity is a pattern by which variation you got maximal change in it. It means it is some very universal definition of complexity. Okay, then we go back to answer our goal to make some systematization or systematic organization of the category of complexity. So if we summarize all those things, there are three sorts of complexity. Synchronic or structural, diachronic or complexity of, of uh, processes, and the list, this last one, which I have uh, uh, proposed, it is combinatorial complexity. So that means complexity can be divided in some three, let's say, coordinate. It is synchronic coordinate, diachronic coordinate, and combinatorial coordinate. But who and what is complex? Who is protagonist of complexity? Now, <laughs> we have somehow go to, to metaphysics. I have uh, borrowed the term actual entity or actuality from the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead. This actuality, these entities who, which are complex, are always combination of, of some uh, kinetics, some structure or whatever. It can be molecule, it can be small system, it can be aggregate, whatever. But it is actual entity because it is temporal and structure, structural in the same time. So actualities which are uh, protagonists of complexity, that means are determined by those three dimensions of complexity. For instance, we have uh, some, let's say, diagram where we have synchronic, diachronic, combinatorial complexity. And those guys here are different actual entities. Each of, of those have its component of diachronic, component of synchronic, and component of uh, combinatorial complexity. Very soon we will see why uh, I have done such rationalization of complexity. But before to do that, let's go a little bit to systems. System theory, as we know it, has been established uh, about 1940s and uh, republished in 1969 uh, by Carl Ludwig von Bertalanti uh, in his book, General Theory of Systems. So this is definition, which I have uh, just copied from his book. The whole is more than some of its parts, but this is what we know also from complexity. It's simply that constitutive characteristics are not explainable from characteristics of the isolated parts. This is also complexity. The characteristics of complex therefore appear as new or emergent entity or whatever. That means we have seen here very uh, large similarity between, between complexity and systems. But how systems and complexity are interrelated? First, I would only to mention some of most important characteristics of systems. Systems are very well connected with the idea of function. We have here yesterday, I think, or over yesterday from Francesca, the, the, the dilemma, what is function in of biomolecule and what is uh, the structure of biomolecule and so on. System theory is just invented for that. 
Then there is teleology because systems somehow develop in the direction to satisfy some functions. Second, third thing is equifinality of systems. That, that means that very different systems can satisfy the same function. And of course, systems are holistics and systems evolve dependently on the environment. But my proposal is that complexity and systems can be interrelated using corresponding, I would say, semi-metaphysical representation. What is this representation? Okay, if we start with our actual entities, which are positioned in a, in a complexity space, then how we make systems, okay, this is another example of different entities suited in complexity space. But what are systems? If we use those actual entities and interconnect them, we can interconnect them in different ways. For instance, in, in system one is made in one way connection and system two has been constructed in another way of connections. But what it is, but this is topological structure. That means system it has topological structure. But what about topological structures? But we know from chemistry for topological structures because chemical formula are topological structures and starting with Hickel theory and structural theory in chemistry, it has been developed theory of graphs. That means the formula is represented by graphs. And the, for instance, this first system one is represented with this left graph and the system two is represented with this second graph. Both graphs shows who is connected, interrelated with who it is in these systems. But how graphs which represent systems can be mathematically represented. They can be represented by matrices. In graph theory, they call it neighbor, neighborhood matrices. For instance, in system two, you have uh, rows and, and, and columns. For instance, uh, point A, entity A is related to B, it is number one, is related to C, it is number one, but A is not related to D, it is zero, and so on. And so we can combine such neighborhood matrix which represent graphs, which represent systems. And what to do with this? If we have, a, if we have already matrix, we can, uh, it is square matrix because it is square matrix, we can make determinant. And if we have determinant, we can, we have, we can to calculate characteristic poly polynomial. And this characteristic polynomial has uh, solutions which are known in the graph theory as the spectrum of the graph. But what is the meaning of all those things? What represents graph spectrum of the system? But, the, but to know more about it, let us go to some phenomenon from graph theory, which is called isospectral graphs. What are isospectral graphs? One, there are many of those, but I have selected Posoya, Posoya as a spectral graph published in 1994. On the left column, you have two graphs, which are different. There are different connections, but, if we, if we calculate characteristic polynomial for both those systems, we will uh, characteristic uh, matrix and determinant, we will have the same polynomial for both of them. That means different graphs, different representation of systems can be described with the same polynomial. That means with the same spectrum of graphs. So, what represents isospectral graphs? Isospectral graphs represent something what is very interesting, represents in principle isofunctional systems. That means if spectrum of the graph is a representation of function, then graphs which represent systems are a representation of systems which can satisfy this 
function. And this is one of one possible representation of the notion of equifinality of systems defined by the talent. So, but what is a graph spectrum? A graph spectrum, it is for isospectral graph. It is a representation of system function. That means different graphs, different representations of systems are approaching to the same spectrum. That means are uh, ready to satisfy the same function. So we have entered also in uh, studying uh, deeper study uh, the principle of function and what, what function is. If graph spectrum is a representation of function, then it could be possible to construct the metaphysics of structure function relationship. But what is structure function relationship? Problem of function. Function uh, appears from the level structure. There are vital function in biology. There are enzyme catalytic function. But enzyme catalytic function don't have any inherent vital function. Enzyme catalytic reaction is chemistry. Its function is from higher level of structure. It is from, but that, so we have not to mix those things. If we synthesize some compound, which can have biological function. So that means we are, chemistry is only synthesis of this compound, but function is something what is not more chemistry. It is biology, medicine, or whatever. Chemical structure on the other side doesn't not have in, inherent catalytic function. Chemical structure can have catalytic function only in specific chemical conditions in, spe in specific reactions. So, but function is somehow correlated with uh, supervenience, isospectrality and equifinality. For instance, color, color is a, a visual effect, which is in principle biological function. Vision is biological function. But color is the consequence of molecular electronic structure in the same time. Color, the same spectrum, I now I think about electronic spectrum, can afford molecules of different structure. That means they molecules are isospectral. I have shown this as a good example of what is isospectrality on this simple. This molecular structure does not possess any vital or biological uh, function. That means vital function is from higher level of complexity. Finally, I wish to mention a very great physical organic chemistry, Michael Polanyi, Mikhail Polanyi, he is originally Hungarian. He is a, he was a, in a, uh, one of authors of uh, transition, uh, transition state theory together with Eiring, Eiring Polanyi, Bell Evans Polanyi principle and so on. So in physical organic uh, chemistry, Polanyi is a very important person. But he has also uh, a lot of papers in philosophy of chemistry and in philosophy of science. And uh, he told that design and natural selection are in principle the same thing. Why? Because design and natural selection are a pressure from the outside, are functions which define formation of systems through isospectrality, through isofunctionality and so on. The limitation of natural behavior to achieve particular function is, a, is the goal which must satisfy the designer. The, we have physical, for instance, we have physical laws of motion. If we wish to make some 
function using those laws, we have to somehow to limit them, to limit them in the way that we build the machine. We have uh, chemical laws, how some compounds behave in some environment to do, to, to, to use it for some functions, we have uh, somehow limit the, the structural properties of this molecule and somehow to focus it on functions on functions which it has to do. So I think uh, in conclusion, uh, the goal of my research is uh, to do two things. First, to find what is relationship between the idea of complexity and the system theory. Second, what is the relationship between complexity and entropy? And third, how all those relationships can be represented by some rational, let's say probably mathematical way, using graph theory and uh, especially developed in the in, in chemistry as chemical graph theory. And finally, I have used all those uh, principles somehow to, to, to make some deeper insight in the idea uh, about what is function and what is structure, uh, something what is today very important in, in modern chemical research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the for the interesting talk. Um, so, uh, and we have some clapping hands. So, if anyone would like to ask a question, I'll ask you to uh, put your hand up, especially using the reaction button at the bottom, because then you you get put in a natural order. I don't always see everybody if they're waving their hand. Yeah. Um, okay, Xavier. Okay, so thank you very much for your talk. I really appreciate uh, your your explanation of systems and how you are and how you are formulating your research. So it came to my mind the problem of computational intractability. Um, mm -hmm. So mainly, uh, you explained pretty much of the graphs and what I've been researching in the part of complexity theory, at least, is that there are some graphs that that are intractable. For example, the, the three colored graphs. So I don't know if you have considered the problem of intractability in, in your research for, for the complexity systems because Turing and Gudel kind of explain this, the problem of, of propositions that are undecidable. Yes, this is an interesting notion. I didn't do it at all until now, but I think it could be done very easily. All, what I wish to say is that uh, there is also a big theory about complexity of molecules developed within graph theory, but I didn't talk about it because it is somehow out of my interest at the moment. But yes, you are right. It is one step further in this research, yes. Uh, of course, there's complexity theory in computer science as well. So that might be used for these uh, when when you're going beyond the representations of a graph. Uh, yeah. Mark had his hand up, but it seems to have disappeared. Mark? I have my hand up. Okay, yeah. Chris Marks, yes. He's here, you. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, thank you very much, very interesting talk. Um, I, I was very interested in looking at the the Wolfram analysis because it uh, and, and with his automata graphs because they struck me as being very similar to chemical reactivity in in the sense that some some chemical reactions uh, are really really quite simple such as say polymerization going from uh, from ethylene to polyethylene that seems like a very simple type of automata whereas other types of chemical reaction um, if we, if we take that like, the set of chemical reactions that say carbon uh, can undergo you get far more complexity in that um, 
I, I know people have looked at this in terms of graph theory. I, I, I haven't a, a great deal, but uh, have many people taken the the, the Wolfram uh, I, idea directly and and and, to, and picked up and run with that? I think uh, I, I have no knowledge of about anybody who is using this in such a way. But maybe there are some. Yeah, but I don't have a. But, but it, it, it yeah. struck me as when I was looking at them, I, I, I could immediately see that there was. Um, it, it looked like chemical reactions and particularly yes. different types of polymerization in yes. the sense that you can have polymerization in, yes. in, in, in a, what, giving one dimensional linear polymers or giving two dimensional um, yes. polymers yes. or even or three dimensional, po two dimensional polymers more but, difficult. But there are uh, some papers about the uh, uh, application of a Wolfram approach to crystallization. At right. Least, uh, it, it could be fundamentally the same thing because yes, uh, I agree. I, I think so. and polymerization are basically the same thing. Yes, but, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There are papers about uh, growth of crystal starting with Wolfram. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I know that the systems community, there are people that are very interested in Wolfram's uh, ideas and they pick up on that quite a lot. Uh, Sebastian. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was very interested. I found the entropic explanation of uh, complexity very interesting. I didn't know it and very logical. However, how can we use that in chemistry? How can you explain the entropy of uh, the structure of a molecule or the entropy of a mechanistic uh, set of reactions? There, I don't have a clue. Yeah, I don't know how we can use in 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 mechanistic chemistry, but your idea is very interesting. I think we have to think about it. That it could be very interesting to to find out, especially complicated chemical systems, how entropy is correlated with complexity. In my experimental work, I am doing uh, solid state reactions, which are very well related to change in complexity, but also with change in entropy. We are measuring entropy of solid state reactions and so on. So you gave me a good idea. Probably something can be done in this sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Aaron? Well, um... Thanks for a very interesting talk. I have a problem because I, I'm interested in many different aspects of what you were saying, and I don't want to take up all the, the day, but I'd start with a question about the limitations of the Wolfram ideas. Uh, and you may be able to tell me that I've misunderstood something, but the, the, the point is this, uh, insofar as he bases his specification for types of structure and types of process on what can be modeled in the game of life uh, mechanism, then there seems to be a very serious limitation that people don't talk about. Namely, you cannot model biological systems which have holes going all the way through them. You cannot get an entity which preserves its structure in the game of life, in the 2D game of life, yeah. Uh, which has a, a persistent coal going through, and therefore you can't have elementary canals and things like that. Uh, do you recognize what I'm saying? Do you think it's a significant objection to what Wolfram is doing? Yes, yes, I think I think you are right. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, it is uh, oversimplification. Yes. What Wolfram is. It is oversimplification, but if I would not take it, then I will be not able to make any representation of systems. So, thank well, you. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I think myself that if we start from other uh, sources, we can go further. I mean, one source which you have been talking about quite a lot and people throughout the conference have, which is what's known about chemistry yeah. and maybe different ways in which we can talk about, and you have begun to do that uh, very clearly. <laughs> different ways in which we can talk about types of 
uh, chemical complexity. And um, uh, uh, another is what we've learned from computation and particular, not the theory of Turing machines and that kind of pure computational idea, but the sort of thing that I think Turing was thinking about before he died, namely yeah. the kinds of things that can in principle be created uh, using more general apparatus than Turing machines, in particular using what you can get out of chemistry. And biological evolution has done an enormous amount of successive additions of complexity of mechanism built on chemistry because everything in biology is built on chemistry. And uh, I've been trying to understand ways in which the processes of reproduction have got increasingly complex for different sorts of species. And I'll be trying to talk a bit more about this on Saturday. But um, I, I wondered whether you have um, thought about ways in which uh, we can think about, for example, the difference between organisms that um, will interact in very complex ways with one another and with the environment and the requirements for building up those competences during the processes of reproduction uh, and how they vary. I mean, this maybe not many people have thought as, as much about that as I have because I've been obsessed about it for, for quite a long time. And in particular, I very recently started thinking, I only noticed uh, about two years ago that the problem of eggs is, is enormous because you get so many different kinds of eggs out of which come vertebrate species, which have enormously complex bodily structures um, and also sophisticated behaviors almost immediately after they're, they're, they're born, they're hatched or whatever. And this is very different for different species. So there's some deep principle that evolution seems to have discovered that is used in egg mechanisms, which produce not only the, the enormously complex internal physical physiology, I mean, biological physiology far exceeds anything humans have been able to design in their labs and, and in their factories and so on, but also the complexity of the behaviors that they can produce. And all of that seems to be a, a kind of discovery of evolution used in reproduction inside eggs, insofar as many animals come out of eggs with quite a lot of competences. So, sorry to interrupt, Aaron, but maybe maybe you want to save some, not give all of your talk away because uh, we want to... Not to discover uh, well, give you talk. thought about any of those problems which might help me. <laughs> I, think is, I think this is an interesting point since egg is an accumulation of information. Yes. Information is accumulated in, in the egg. Yeah, this is an interesting point. Thank you. Well, if you have any ideas, <laughs> I'd be glad to learn. Okay, okay. Yes. Let me think of it. Yeah. If, if I may abuse my chair position, I also have a question, which is um, at the beginning of the talk, you talked about the limit of complexity um, yeah. in a closed system. Yes. And then of course, one might think that in an infinite system, therefore you have, you have unlimited complexity, but that's not necessarily the case. And it certainly isn't the case if you have an open system, but you're just looking locally, especially if you're careful about which locality. So, um, I mean, to, I don't know, take the universe or something uh, and look at a solar system. Uh, this has uh, not too high a complexity, presume, well, it has, I mean, it depends on, on the scale, but the, yeah. the general complexity is not all that high. Um, but it's an open system, right? Because because uh, meteors come in or, or comets come in and that sort of thing. So uh, I'm not I'm not sure that closest well closed system has to be there for the mathematics and to make a, a very straight statement. But most systems that we look at are actually open systems, especially chemical systems, and chemical processes are open. 
And I, I don't know that it matters that much. Um, uh, the, that, you know, the, the notion of limit, it, it might be sufficient. We might want to introduce a notion of sufficient limit so that we, you know, we recognize that the process is the same one again or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have yeah. thoughts about that. Well, I told uh, this term, closed systems, just uh, to show that there is nothing going from outside in the system. It is, it is local in a relativistic sense. In the relativistic sense, information cannot move very far. So, what is what is going on? Two hundred years of light it has nothing to do with what is going on here, because in that sense we are a closed system. But the basic idea about the disappearance of complexity, limits of complexity, is that the energy of interaction. Which, which will be required for make more complex system disappears. It is so small that we don't have structure. We don't have stable, like a potential energy surface. If it is, becomes completely flat, then we have no more minima. That means we have no complex structure. Right. That was my intention, yeah. Right, right, right. And then if you go sort of, you know, far enough away from matter in the universe, then there isn't any energy anymore. And or there's such little energy that that you have no complexity either. I take it. Is that right? the opposite side. If you if you go to simplicity, you must to to, to build a super collider, which is the same as a, as universe. Okay. It's not only 36 kilometers, okay. like in CERN, but it should be enormously large. This is left side of this diagram. Okay. That was idea of about limitation. Okay, thank you. Jerry has his hand up. Jerry Chandler, you have to unmute. Yes. Thank you. A very interesting uh, presentation and uh, rather novel from several perspectives. Uh, and as uh, I would only make some comments with regard to, uh, to my own uh, thoughts about this matter, which I have been concerned about with for now, uh, uh, really almost a half a century, uh, particularly with regard to the respect to the nature of biological mutation and the uniqueness of the chemical uniqueness of biological mutation. <clears throat> which emerges from the uh, notion that a single DNA base, uh, mute, when it's changed in the sequence of a single DNA base leads to a change in the entire organism. And so one needs some sort of amplification uh, process in order for biological complexity to emerge. And in, from that perspective, uh, I would come to the following four, uh, if you would, necessities for uh, complexity in the real world of biology. And I'll just list these. I won't try to explain them. I'll just give them to you. And uh, uh, in this context, so the first one is the necessity to tie uh, syntropy to entropy. Syntropy was a term in, induced by an Italian mathematician in the 1940s as a complement to the notion and is comparable to the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, the second part uh, is the inverse square laws. You absolutely need the inverse square laws to get biological complexity. Uh, the third thing, which I mentioned yesterday in the discussion was a table of elements in number theory. You absolutely need number theory to describe complex systems. And finally, uh, but not, not only number theory, but formal language is the same thing. Well, the lingua this is another aspect of the language yeah. of chemistry. The yeah. logic of the language of chemistry, which is Michelle, one of Michelle's interests, uh, yeah. the logic of the language of chemistry is very radically distinct from the language of physics and the language of mathematics. Yes. Yes. So you need a semantics yes. to describe, for example, the relationship between an enzyme working uh, 
as a chemical catalysis, we're using the language of chemistry and yes. its biological function, where the function is con a contribution to the overall dynamics of life itself. And so this is this exactly is what I have represented. Yes, yes this is exactly what I told. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, these four attributes of the logic or the language of complexity, I find are necessary for biological complexity and certainly for any notion about reproduction and the amplification logic using uh, work, first, first order uh, thermodynamics of work uh, in order to construct the living system. Thank you. Thank you for your comments.